This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 118 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Rachel McLean all about how to write award-winning crime and also how to take your business from selling just a couple of books a day to thousands of books a day. Now, this week's episode is a little different. As this is airing over the Christmas holidays, um, I decided to record this intro before Christmas. And so I don't uh, I don't have all of the normal things. We're going to more or less rock straight into the episode because I needed a break. Um, and so yes, I hope you can forgive uh, your rebel host this week uh, for not doing a normal intro. Before we go into the show though, I just wanted to say uh, thank you. Thank you to everybody who listens weekly, everybody who has jumped in and out of the show, everybody who has been there from the beginning and those who have joined recently. I appreciate each and every single one of you and I am very, very grateful, just as I am to all of the show's patrons. I hope that everybody has had a wonderful, love-filled and joy-filled Christmas and that you are full of hope and joy for 2022. I think that's it. I'm not going to say any more. I'm just going to let the episode run and we will be back to a normal schedule next week. Happy Christmas and Happy New Year. First, this week's episode is sponsored by the ever amazing Kobo Writing Life. So I'm going to play a quick word from the sponsor. Please do all go and get your digital books from Kobo and, and then we shall get on with the episode. Hey Rebels, we're from Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast, and easy self-publishing platform. Kobo Writing Life was built by authors for authors, and our team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. One of the ways we're doing that is by giving you the chance to reach subscription readers by opting your titles into Kobo Plus. Kobo Plus is our subscription program, which offers thousands of titles in an all-you-can-read catalog to readers in select countries. It's currently available in the Netherlands, Belgium, Portugal, and Canada, with plans to expand. Stay tuned for that. Authors can opt into all territories or pick and choose as they please. It's really important to us that authors retain complete control over their work, which is why we will never ever ask you to be exclusive. You can opt your books in on a per title basis and continue selling them on all other retailers. Kobo Plus helps get your books in front of a new audience of subscription readers, who are a different audience than our typical a la carte readers, and allows you to earn money on top of your a la carte sales. Authors get paid for every minute spent reading, including rereads, so opt your books in now and reach even more Kobo readers. If you want to learn more about Kobo Writing Life, check out our blog, podcast, and find us on social. You can create your free account at kobo.com slash writing life. Now back to Sasha. Happy writing. Hello, and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I am joined by Rachel McLean. Rachel is an award-winning crime author who writes UK-based police procedurals. She is best known for the D.I. Zoe Finch series set in her hometown of Birmingham, as well as the Dorset Crime series. Book one in the Dorset Crime series, The Corf Castle Murders, won the Kindle Storyteller Award 2021, which I had the great honour and pleasure of getting to read. (laughs) Hello and welcome. Hello, and thank you very much for inviting me on. No, you're most welcome. It's uh, I like we've known each other in the community for I actually don't even know how long, but it's a really long time because of Ally and sort of like Ally is this wonderful organization. If you guys are, and listeners are not uh, members that it, I don't know how to describe it. I always describe it. I don't know if I'm correct in doing that, but it's like a union for authors in, in a way, you know, because they campaign yep. on our behalf. There's discounts and they do like content information stuff for us as well. So they're just fantastic. Anyway. And so I met Rachel uh, through that. And so we have, but I don't think I've actually ever met you on a Zoom. No, we've, we've never, we've never met in person either. But have you never I been to the, think. like, you've never been to because the Because we were Book supposed, Fair. we were supposed to get together at London Book Fair in 2020. And then ah. London Book Fair was cancelled. And we were both at the self-publishing show live. And I remember Indeed. looking out for you, but Indeed. it was a crowded event and <laughs> I didn't spot you. It's so um, funny because <laughs> I feel like I've met you before. 
I know, I think I know. we've exchanged so much, yeah. emails and social media and all sorts of stuff so many times. Yeah. And, and we've both seen each other on video and photos and yeah, all yeah. the rest of it. So, yeah. So when listeners, uh, for listeners, I'm really embarrassed now. When Rachel joined the Zoom, I was just like, yeah, 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 blah, 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 blah. Like, as if I didn't realise, I just forgot that we hadn't, just feel like we've we've known each other and met each other before. So sorry about, maybe I should start with, hey, it's lovely to meet you. <laughs> it's lovely to finally yeah. meet you online. Hope, Hopefully maybe, we'll meet in person sometime I, soon. Are you going to London Book Fair in April? I am, yes. Yeah. Then we shall, we, we must pencil in a coffee. So that is a must. Yeah. Well, for listeners who haven't known you as long as I have, <laughs> would you like to tell everyone a little bit about yourself and kind of your journey? Like, how did you get to where you are today? Yes, well, I uh, like a lot of writers. I've been writing since I was very small, wrote my first novel in inverted commas when I was about 10, I think, which was a serialised story that I wrote for the school creative writing class. Don't have a copy of it anymore. It was probably dreadful, but my teacher liked it. Um, and then sort of had the creative writing knocked out of me at secondary school really because once you get past the age of about 12 they want you to write essays instead and Mm. read other people's writing instead of writing your own and so I I but I was always I was always interested in writing so every job I ever had I was always the writer on the team I was always the person who people would come to ask about possessive apostrophes and punctuation and grammar and all sorts of things and I was the person who the boss would say can you edit so, you know somebody else's work without telling them because yeah. <laughs> they'd be worried that they'd be offended by it and then in oh goodness um 18 years ago because it was around the time that I got pregnant with my oldest son and he's going to be 17 in a couple of weeks um I was on a business writing course and I didn't actually have any business writing to do because I was the person who'd commissioned the course so I was there to check it out and we had to mind map a writing project so I decided to mind map a novel And that turned into my first novel, which didn't then get published for many years because, well, I got I got pregnant with Jamie and I wrote the first draft while I was pregnant with him. I went on an Arvon Foundation writing retreat and finished it there. And that was fabulous. And then thought, oh, maternity leave, it'd be great. I'm not at work. I can finish this book. (laughs) And then realised that babies tend to keep you quite busy. So, (laughs) so yeah, I then picked up the writing again many years later when I I met another writer, Heidi Goody, who's an indie author. Um, Happened to meet her through a a coding event that our sons were at. And she said, oh, I'm involved in a local writers group. Come along. And I did and haven't looked back since. Oh, that's that's such a lovely story. I love that you and because Heidi's also an ally member, isn't she? So that's like she a is, yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Um, okay, well, so our episode is gonna be an episode of two halves, really. The first uh, half we're gonna talk about crime because you are a very successful crime author. And then the other half, we're gonna talk about more generally author success and, and how to get there and your journey and advice um on on going from you know selling a couple of copies a day to selling bajillions so (laughs) in your expert opinion what makes a good crime book I think there are two things one is that there are tropes in crime and you have to hit those tropes and if you try too hard to create something unique and different and um, you you try and stand out from the crowd you actually don't keep readers happy. So there has to be a crime. It has to be a significant crime. So it can't be, you know, just a burglary or something like that. It has to be a murder or a kidnapping, really. Um, There has to be a team or an individual who solve it. And it does have to be solved. And I think one of the reasons that crime has done so well over the last couple of years is because you have that closure and that sense of justice in the world, that Mm. the crime is always solved and the baddie is always brought to justice. The other, the second aspect of a successful crime novel is the characters. And something I discovered when I was researching the genre before I started writing crime was actually when people are leaving reviews for crime books, they don't tend to actually mention the mystery. As long as the mystery is coherent and interesting and there are some twists and turns and red herrings, that's not the thing that people come back for. People come back 
for the detective or the team of detectives and they get to know them over the course of the series and they will have views on who their favourites are and what the relationships are between them and what they want to happen to the baddie if you've got an ongoing series baddie which I always do and that's what really makes the difference I think between an average crime novel and a really successful one that readers love. Yeah, and so I suppose side characters are super important because, you know, they are making up a, a consistent cast who, who appear and reappear and reappear and reappear because they're, they're a team, I suppose. Yeah, that's really interesting. Have you read the um, universe? Wait, no, it's not what it's called. Seven Figure Fiction, the universal fantasy, the one with the yellow cover, Theodora Taylor? No, I haven't read that one. Oh, so I she, will make a note of that. Yeah, I binge read that in about... I like one cup of coffee (laughs) because um she so she so she says universal fantasy is different to tropes I I'm not sure I it feels like they're tropes but very granular so like almost another level down in detail but um she talks about how important that is to readers and um yeah it's really making me think differently about fiction so yeah I don't know like are there other I don't know tropes or things that you're seeing in crime like what are your do you I take it you read crime as well I do yes what are your kind of favorite things that you see in crime uh what I like is that we're getting more female protagonists and more female detectives and that they are very varied um, they're not all based on Prime Suspect um, uh, or on Vera mm. in the Anne Cleves books um, and, and younger detectives as well. So I mean, my Zoe Finch is 40, which I know to some people is quite old. I know when I was a teenager, I thought that was ancient. But <laughs> compared to historically some of the detectives that you've seen in books, that's quite young. And I think that means you can introduce a bit more action because you know, she's a black belt in karate. So Love I deliver, you know, I have scenes where she uses her karate skills and I made sure I set those up at the beginning. I didn't suddenly have her doing <laughs> karate you go and, people right at the end. <laughs> did you go and train for like inspiration and research? Or <laughs> Well, my son is a black belt in karate. Oh, so um, so yeah. I asked him, I was like, so what's this move? And what's yeah, this, yeah. this stance and all this sort of thing? And he was trying to remember. And the weird thing is he can't remember them unless he does them because it's like that muscle memory. So yeah. he had to, we had to sort of work through them together and try and work out what she would do. I love that. Do you know the funny thing is, I am about a year away from my black belt in Taekwondo oh. and um, I have not really ever written martial arts into my story. <laughs> so what a wasted opportunity. I'm gonna like make a note to myself to make sure I put in some badassery in the form of like, I don't know. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, martial arts. Um, okay. so. Obviously, you've got like a ton of crime books now and you read crime books. So what mistakes do you see like newer authors making when they come into the crime genre, uh, like with their crime stories? Are there mistakes you see them making? Like what what are your bugbears or things that kind of irk you when you're reading? I think it's often the the writing style. Um, Readers of crime fiction want write very straightforward writing that doesn't draw attention to itself and I deliberately write I write very short chapters short sentences short paragraphs so the page is broken up a lot because people want a page turner when they're reading a crime novel and I love it when people email me and said I was up till three o'clock last night reading your book I always yeah, email them I, I devoured saying, oh, it. I'm so sorry <laughs> but yeah, I'm yeah. not sorry yeah. really <laughs> this is great because uh, yeah. that's what you want to achieve. And I think that you'll find books where people use too much exposition. They're using language that they're trying to be more literary in their, their style of writing. And I know that that was something that, that I did too much in my early days of writing. And it's probably a good job I got that over with, with other genres of books that didn't really hit their genre very well and were quite difficult to market. So by the time I got to crime... I'd lost the sense of feeling I had to prove myself through my prose and actually realise that the prose in this genre is there to do a job Mm. and that's to tell the story and engage you with the characters. Yeah, yeah. So in any crime book, there are, of course, red herrings. There are clues. Mm -hmm. There are genuine foreshadowed hints. 
you know, and evidence that um, is either wrong or right, or, you know, it, it sort of leads the, the detectives astray or down the right path. How the fuck do you manage that in your brain? <laughs> because, like, I struggle <laughs> to keep information, like, about my subplots that I, you know, for my story. So, like, do you have a system or, like, what tools do you use? Like, how do you, how do you plot out that the clues and stuff how do you yeah talk to me about the systems of creating evidence yeah. and things. with my first crime book deadly wishes I plotted all that out in advance I had a spreadsheet and it was hugely complex and I actually printed it all out and pinned it on the back of my writing room door and it looked fantastic because I color coded it and everything I probably spent longer on the spreadsheet than I did writing the book <laughs> these things can be very tempting as a form of procrastination but to be honest now I often cheat and that's that I go in and add those red herrings afterwards. Because what the reader doesn't realise is that the writer doesn't have to write the book in a linear way. So I will write the story and the crime linearly, if that's a word. But I, I don't actually know who did it until close to the end. So I will have a cast of suspects. And I know this is unusual, but I like to surprise myself by developing those characters and working out which one I like the least so no they can way. be the one who did it um, and sometimes it'll just come to me I think oh yes that's how they did it so I'll go back and make a few tweaks often to just a few chapters proceeding because that's where the ideas were coming with for, for me but then when I've finished I will sometimes go back and write edit an existing scene or write a new scene that introduces either a clue or a red herring so I think the fact that I don't know who did it until I'm about three quarters of the way through writing means that quite a lot of red herrings come in anyway, because I've got all these people who could have done it and they're all behaving suspiciously. Um, and actually what can be a bigger challenge is making sure that I tie off all those loose ends with the red herrings and make sure that I explain them. So okay. That the reader doesn't think, well, oh, why wasn't it them? It could have been them. Yeah, no, I think that's amazing. The fact that you don't know, like it sort of gives me hives a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> of going in and not knowing like, I think I'd shit my pants trying to try to do that <laughs> but also I find it fascinating you mentioned something there about um suspicion and the fact that it's really important that you have more than one character acting suspiciously and I think that sort of plays also into like creating um tension and mystery so like what does a character acting suspiciously look like how do you get characters to act suspiciously and and sort of tie that in with creating that air of mystery like because obviously that hooks a reader through so yeah how mm. do you do that what advice do you have um, sometimes it can't be that it, it could be that they're not actually acting suspiciously, but that there are things that are hidden about them. So they might be cooperating with the police, but in reality, there's something going on in their background that gives them a motive. Um, a lot of the time, it's the fact that they're lying or they contradict themselves or they'll say one thing to one detective and another thing to another member of the team. Um, sometimes I'll have scenes taking place that don't involve the investigation that are between the people affected by the crime, where you've got people saying things to each other that make you wonder what was going on, or again, that might be contradictory to what they've said to the police. So there's a whole range of things, really, and it tends to grow quite organically out of those characters. So I'll start by, I'll start with a crime often a crime and a location, because particularly when I write about Dorset, I'm often inspired by the locations. So I'll start with a crime and then, then the victim comes next. So yeah, I'm, I've always got to have at least two murders. I've made a rod for my own back by calling them all the something murders, this series. Um, so sometimes I'll have two right at the beginning and then I don't have to necessarily put another one in later on, but sometimes I'll have a what they call a, um, a well, a midpoint one, what they call a twin board, twin, no, twin body plot <laughs> two bodies um and um so yeah so I've got my victim and then I'll think right so who are the people in that victim's life um who are the people close to them who are the people they've fallen out with people in their personal life their work life in their past and I'll often have one of those people become a point of view character and that might be a suspect or it might be somebody who's afraid for themselves that they might be the next victim and so I'll allow the reader to see the crime from a different point of view from them as well as from the police team's point of view and I think that makes it 
it makes it interesting for me because I get to get into the head of a new character in every book. Uh, but it also gives a, an added layer of complexity and the reader seeing things that the detectives aren't necessarily seeing. Yeah, I think that is very cool. Um, OK, so a couple of more crime questions before we we dive into author success. Let's talk about. In fact, this may actually be something that we, we cover a bit more in, on a different angle later on. But let's talk about reader expectations in terms of crime, details and realism. How realistic do you have to be when you write crime? How much police procedural knowledge does one need to write a crime book? And how the fuck do you even do that? Like, how do you <laughs> penetrate a police force to find all this stuff out? Yeah. Oh, I have, I have a beta reader who's a retired detective. Oh, well, now that's very handy. <laughs> yeah, and his son is a serving detective. So his son doesn't have time to read the books. But Dave will read the books, the retired detective, and he will comment if I've got things wrong. It's often not so much to do with the procedure of the investigation, but it might be the sort of politics of policing and how people get promoted and that kind of thing, because you can't find that anywhere. That's just something that you know from having worked there. So he'll give me feedback on those. And if it's something that's particular, that's sort of new, more modern, and he's not so sure about because it's been more in since he retired he'll ask his son about it um i also have a whole shelf of textbooks so i've got um i've got the textbooks that police use when they're taking their exams which you can buy on amazon um i've also got some really gory forensic pathology textbooks with all sorts of unpleasant photographs of what happens to bodies that have been left in certain circumstances and killed in certain ways i want those um, recommendations my uh, personal <laughs> obsession is death like i can't i like i have read so many books about um uh like mortuary assistants people who do post-mortems, like uh, traditional death practices, like cultural death celebrations and like all these different mm. death things across different societies. I find it fascinating, like yeah. our relationship with death. But yeah, I'm definitely interested in that. Not that I'm going to write crime, but just because I'm <laughs> strange. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I look that way, I've got a whole shelf that's, I, I've got a lot of textbooks, but I've also got a lot of memoirs of people who've worked. There are quite a, a, a lot of memoirs by people who are very specific forensic technologists or pathologists or whatever that I've read. Um, Three recommendations from your shelf that you can see. <laughs> um, right, Val McDermid's Forensics. I think it's called Forensics. Um, obviously, Val McDermid is a crime writer, but she's done so much research over the years that her book is a very accessible way in to learning about forensics. Um, Carla Valentine. Um, no. Yes. Her book is called Past Mortems. I loved that one. Yeah, she um, she also did a podcast on BBC Sounds called Mortem. And you got a real sense of her enthusiasm about her job in, in quite a gory way, but in a very scientific and fascinating way. Um, what else have we got? There's a book that I read written by a female member of the Met on the line by Alice Vintner. And she was, so obviously it's a different context. She's not a detective, but she was a, a, a uniform copper and she wrote a memoir about her time working in the Met. And that was fascinating for some of the, the detail of the language and the jargon and the way they talk to each other. Mm. It's really, those sort of memoirs are really useful for that sort of thing. Have you read Stiff? No. So Stiff, I, I just finished Stiff um, and I actually read the audio book. Oh, listeners are getting uh, <laughs> live recommendations between authors. Here we go. So um, Stiff <laughs> is by Mary Roach and it is probably, it's a few years old now, maybe maybe even 15 years old. Um, no, maybe 10 years old because it was she talked about 2010 in it. Um, it's one of the more graphic ones that I've ever read. It is not like don't listen to it as you're eating like <laughs> make sure you've got a really stiff like mindset you're ready because it because some of the you know like Carla Valentine's was was very fun and you know she's really positive and bubbly and but but there are yeah. some that are a bit more graphic and that was definitely one that was more graphic I definitely was like wow to some of the things right. that she was talking about but um 
yeah fantastic highly recommend stiff um oh, i don't know where we were. as soon as we get off this call <laughs> yeah well it's funny <laughs> you're asking I... me about the oh, yeah. research that i do for my yes. crime so it's the having a detective who reads them and then and then all these gory and fascinating books yeah yeah no, like it's just our search histories honestly like i swear <laughs> if we're ever investigated we are all fucked like we're all completely oh yes through. okay my last crime question crime books are like standalones in a way because they're episodic it's a open and shut case like within the book but then quite often um, authors are also writing in series. Like I remember when I was a teenager, I read a lot of um, Patricia Cornwall. Um, and although each crime was like open and shut in the book, there were also things that that kind of bled into the series. So how, how do you balance that? How much information is enough information? You know, I don't quite know what I'm saying. Maybe you know what I'm trying to say. Like, how do you do yeah. that balance between episodic and also something that is still in a series? My series have quite a strong series arc. So I will have a story that is running through the series that actually is the more interesting story. Um, and it tends to be in, in the Zoe Finch series, it was about police corruption. So she got an inkling in the first book that her boss might be corrupt. And then over the course of the series, there were more clues and other characters discovering things and her wondering whether other characters were involved in this. And then when we got to the sixth book, that book was actually all about police corruption. So it opened with the murder of a, a retired detective who it turned out was an associate of this boss that was corrupt. And there was a, a court case involving another corrupt detective. And so that brought it all to a head. So what I tend to do is in the early books of the series, that will only be quite light touch. It'll just be a little bit. And there'll be a few references to it, a couple of scenes maybe where you, you get an idea of what's going on. I'll tend to finish each book with a sort of light cliffhanger around the series arc so I don't make it a complete dun -dun cliffhanger but I sow some doubt or a question in the reader's mind as to what's really going on with that story so I've got a story in the Dorset crime series that is about the death of Leslie the protagonist's predecessor so the guy who was doing her job before her supposedly committed suicide and it becomes quite clear he didn't commit suicide. She's trying to find out what really happened, but nobody wants her to. She's hushed up. And so she brings in other professionals who she works with who aren't directly part of her team to help her with that. Gets herself into a bit of trouble over that. Um, and But then over time, she realises that her team know more about it than, than she originally thought. And she can actually bring them in and trust them on it. So that's... That's something that's very much designed to keep the reader wanting to come back for more. And also for me, I really enjoy those series of arcs. I find that actually the mo most interesting part of the story because it involves the characters much more. It's not just them doing their jobs. It's always something that's that affects them personally as well. And do, so I take it you decide that before you start the series? I decide what the arc is about and what it is that the protagonist has got suspicions might be happening, but I won't decide exactly what happened or how it's going to conclude. Because if I do that, I'll end up rewriting it by the end anyway. So mm. I've, I've realized with my writing, I used to plot all the way through to the end of either a series or a book. And then by the time I got about two thirds of the way through, I change it. So now I've realized that actually that's a complete waste of time. So I don't do it. You don't <laughs> but plot I do anything. Plot. Oh, I do plot. When I'm about to start on a book, I'll plot quite high level and I'll plot the first mm, third of the book in quite a lot of detail. And then as I'm coming towards the end of that plotted third, I'll pause and I'll plot the next, say, 10, 15 percent of the book. And I'll keep doing that as I go along. So I've always got about 10 to 15 chapters in front of me that are plotted out. Um, but I don't do the whole thing at the beginning. No, that's I love, I love, love, love listening to authors like writing processes because I don't think I've ever met 
two authors who do it the same mm. ever and I've spoken to a lot of authors so yeah okay so I'm going to draw a line under the crime and we're going to talk about author success so you have a new book coming out would you like to just quickly uh give a bit of an overview of your book yes it's called five steps to author success and it details the five main things that I did to get myself from being somebody who at the beginning of 2020 was selling a few books a day to now, two years later, selling a few thousand books a day. So it takes you through the processes that, that I went through before I even sat down and wrote a word of crime in order to maximise my chances of those books being successful. OK, and a lot of what you talk about in the book is um, like writing for readers. So can you tell listeners, like, what does that mean? Because everybody hears the words writing for readers and will probably be like, well, yeah, like, who else are you writing for? <laughs> but you have like a specific meaning around that. So what does it mean and how do you do it? I think there are two aspects to it. One is around understanding your genre really, really well. So what the tropes are, what people respond to, what readers are loving right now in your genre, not what they loved when you were reading that genre as a child. Um, and the other one is, is getting past your own perceptions of what makes a good book. So I think what I talked about earlier about the prose that doesn't draw attention to itself. I think all of us, when we start writing, we want to write beautiful prose. And that's what we spend a lot of time focusing on. And I know in my writers group, when we're giving each other feedback, it's often on the prose and not the story. And in, a, in many ways, that's easier to, to fix. It's easier to tinker with the prose once you've already written a book. It's much harder to change the underlying story. So what I've done is quite consciously got away from what would necessarily be my perfect book and write something that I think will be the reader's perfect book. This is so interesting because I am changing genre next year. And, um, but I, I can't write in a genre that I'm not interested in. So I have to take my time and find a genre where, that I think I can sell in and that I will enjoy writing in. Um, but interestingly, I so I've been binge reading uh, in this genre and trying to like understand the common tone feel. And like the one thing that I think I've seen in in all of the books that I've read is banter. And I'm like, this is so ideal because I love writing funny stuff. And um, and but when you write with the level of humor that is in these books you there isn't room for flowery you know deeply metaphorical prose there yeah. just isn't <laughs> and and it's funny I was laughing as you were saying about you know like beautiful prose like there is part of me that <laughs> wants to write beautiful <laughs> prose and I'm like you know what Sasha you just gotta write the funny shit because that's <laughs> what they want so yeah, yeah I think you may have just prevented me from uh fucking up so thanks for that <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it helps if you wrote in another capacity professionally before you write fiction because you learn that your writing is there to do a job mm. so I wrote um I worked in politics for a while and I would write briefing documents for MPs and what I learned very fast is that actually um what what a lot of us writers would consider really bad prose is actually very effective in politics so you know those sub-editors working for the tabloids we all look down on them but they are very talented writers because they are able to capture something and not only get an idea across but influence the way you think with just a few words and it's very very tight writing and not at all flowery and I think writing in those sort of circumstances trains you to think of writing as something that you do for a purpose that's not about you, that it's there to do a job. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Oh, so true. Just give the readers what you want and you'll sell loads of books. I mean, it loads of books, loads of books. Um, it's, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, oh, it's, 
this is what the seven figure fiction book says as well like give them the tropes mm. you know she, she goes off on this sort of rant in the book about how everybody looks down on you for writing like harem stories or bully romances but like she's laughing on the other side of her you know thousands and thousands of pounds yeah. and I'm like yep I wouldn't mind laughing on the other side of that either <laughs> <laughs> um, okay so what kind of mistakes should writers avoid when it comes to trying to write for readers um I think I think the big one that we've talked about is trying to be too clever with your prose I think also trying to be too clever, um, if you're a crime writer, trying to be too clever with your mystery, because the mystery isn't actually the most important part of the book, it's the characters. And it can be, you do have to spend a lot of time on the mystery. You have to have a lot of scenes where they're doing the investigation, but actually what's going on in those scenes is conversations between the characters that's building those relationships and those characters. And it's doing as much of that job as it is of showing us the mystery. Um, so I think not fully understanding the tropes of your genre and making assumptions about what they are. So you might read something and think, oh, yeah, that's that's a tropes. I can bend my book to that or I can bend the tropes to my book. Actually, I, I made this mistake with my first few books. I wrote books. All of my books were crossover books and they were crossovers between genres that didn't fit very well together so I wrote a dystopian political thriller that got great reviews and I loved writing it but I just didn't know who to sell it to um it, yeah I managed to get some good sales right at the beginning I actually got a lot of good sales off the back of Bodyguard a tv show weirdly which was set in Westminster um and then I wrote a post-apocalyptic psychological thriller which wow. was just as bizarre as it sounds I started off with a post-apocalyptic idea and then I thought oh I need to hit a market with this I'll turn it into a psychological thriller which really was not the best way to go about it so I learned from that that you have to identify your genre and you have to hit it and not try and pretend that your book is in a genre if it really isn't so yeah, I think that genre yeah. research so you know when you're looking at calytics you should be doing that before you write not afterwards really Mm. I, th I think it's really interesting because there are definitely like there are books in my head that I I am going to write just because I want to write them like mm. and they're not going to sell and I know that and that's fine like I've, I've you know sometimes we have these books that we just have to write um, and like yeah you you still have permission listeners if you want to write things that you want to write you have permission <laughs> to do that but if you want to sell a fuck bucket of books and you know quickly and build an audience and, and build a fan base then you have to deliver what the reader wants and and yeah so when you mentioned that you did a lot of research beforehand so like what kinds of things did you look for what kind of information were you digging up like how were you doing your research I read a load of crime books and I read people who would be my comps so I read other indie crime authors and I read the authors who are published by the digital publishers so for example Angela Marsh Marsons is a big comp of mine because she writes about a female DI in the black country which is just down the road from Birmingham so I get a lot of people commenting on my books saying they read both um, and I would love to achieve her level of sales um, she's sold millions and they're great books uh, so I read a lot of those books and I I went through them in detail and I made notes and I identified what was going on in each chapter so what was each chapter actually achieving? Was it about the plot? Was it about the mystery? Was it about the characters? Was it about the setting? And the setting is really important in mm. crime as well. People like a well-drawn location. Um, was it an action scene? And I found that there was a pattern to these books. And I actually, again, made a spreadsheet, color-coded it, which really helped me see the pattern. And you could see that certain aspects and certain the purposes of those chapters were more common in at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book um and I used that to help me build the shape of my own book I also read reader reviews so I read the five star and the one star reviews for those authors to identify what it was readers loved and what they didn't love and often the fact that what readers don't love doesn't always tell you that that isn't a good thing about the book it just tells you that that isn't the right reader for the book because sometimes there'll be the exact same thing in the five and one star reviews yeah. but that also gave me some clues about 
how to hit that market and how to make sure I was targeting at the right readers as well. So the reader reviews were really important. And that was that was where I really hit on the fact that readers responded to the characters more than the mysteries was in the reviews because nobody talked about the mysteries in the reviews. They all talked about the characters. Mm, fascinating. I am. Um, I uh, have you ever done your Clifton Strengths like Becca Symes? No, I've, I've done MBTI. And I do that on my characters. <laughs> do you? I uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bug you about uh, Clifton Strengths afterwards. What's your MBTI if you feel comfortable sharing? INTP. INTP. Okay, cool. All right. Um, okay, so uh, last couple of questions. Top three sort of rapid fire tips for to go from selling a handful of copies to thousands of copies a day. First one is to think like a professional author. And that's really about thinking about readers and business and not thinking of it as a hobby, part of which is showing up and writing regularly and being prepared to write rubbish rather than writing nothing. Um, the second one would be researching your genre and your market. I know the crime genre and what's going on in the Amazon charts in crime inside out. And I look at it every day, often multiple times a day, particularly when I've got a new release. And the third one is what I call the Venn diagram of craft, which is finding the sweet spot between what you love to read, what readers love to read, and what you're good at writing. So it's not just what you love and what readers love, it's where your skills lie. And for me, the reason I chose crime instead of cosy mystery is because my skills lie in building suspense, and they don't lie in building sort of fern idyllic, um, characters and locations and although I quite like writing a bit of banter I couldn't write to the level of comedy that you need for a successful cozy mystery through a whole book it would wear me out I didn't even know cozy mysteries were meant to be funny but I've never read a cozy mystery so that tells yeah. you everything <laughs> they often are modern cozy mysteries often are funny oh, I didn't know that I have literally never read a cozy mystery I, I I'm not a uh, I don't that doesn't appeal to me Mm. The of they tend to either be funny or very clever mm. um, so Richard Osman's books for example The Thursday Murder Club um, uh, a bit clever not as clever as I think they think they are but they're very funny which you expect they're written by a comedian mm. uh, and there's there's a real wit to those books that feels like it comes naturally but then you never know Oh, you've given me so many ideas for things and <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm going to, yeah. Oh, anyway. Right. Okay. My last question. What is it like being a award-winning author? It's fab. <laughs> I, I would be lying if I said anything else. Yeah. I mean, when they told me I'd been shortlisted, I thought that the experience of going to the awards ceremony, meeting Claire Balding, meeting lots of other writers there's some great writers on the shortlist they had a parliamentary reception and lots of other authors were at that I thought that would all be fantastic and that was all I was interested in and I genuinely it didn't even consider I didn't even consider the, the idea that I might win so then when Claire Baldy announced live on a, a, a zoom call that was being broadcast and I knew my family and friends were watching she announced that I'd won and said what would you like to say and who would you like to thank I thought oh my god my mind is completely <laughs> blank <laughs> but apparently I was coherent oh, were you? <laughs> and I remembered most of the people I would have liked to have remembered um, but yeah it's I'm still coming down from the high and it's been so much fun uh, all the all the attention that I've got I, I, I mean I am an introvert my INTP but I, I do quite like I, I think the thing that was nice that hit me at the parliamentary reception was because everybody knew who I was because I was the winner it meant I didn't have to introduce myself to anybody mm -hmm. and that feeling when you go into a room and you don't know anybody and if there are people there you want to talk to and you're going to have to go over and say hello but they were coming to me and saying hello because I'd already been pointed out as the person who'd won I was so That's gutted great. I couldn't make it I was absolutely devastated literally what happened I booked flights to see my dad because I hadn't seen my dad in two and a half years and then I think it was like literally the next day or the day after I got the invite and I was like for fuck's sake <laughs> I would never have missed the booze up <laughs> like, never. it was a fun it. night I bet it, it was, was quite it. funny because 
there were lots of politicians there and they they wanted me to talk to the politicians and the politicians wanted to talk to me one of whom was my mp who i did not vote for yeah. um, and i spoke to him as briefly as i possibly could oh he was yes eh. um <laughs> so um i was i was stood there talking to politicians looking over their shoulders all the time thinking oh so and so is over there and all that so and so and writers walking in and i just wanted to talk to the writers eventually the politicians eventually they sort of left trickled out and it ended up with all the writers drinking the free booze and then we went to the pub and, and much fun was had i bet oh i'm gutted maybe next year maybe next year so this is the rebel author podcast tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel well, this is something I've actually got in common with my protagonist in the Dorset crime books, Leslie, because over the course of the books, she realises that she's gay and comes out and has a relationship with a woman called Elsa, who she meets in the bar in Wareham. And I came out when I was 50, which is probably not that rebellious these days, but it certainly was when I was younger, which is probably why I left it till I was 50, to be honest. Yeah, no, I think it, I don't know if it's... I don't know if I would say it's a rebellion, but I think it's a rebellion against like society because it's being true to ourselves, right? Like it is a very hard thing to do. It's hard for family. It's hard for you. It's hard for like the people around you because they build expectations. And so they expect you to be one way. And when you're not, that goes against everything that they've like known and been used to. But like we have to be true to ourselves. Right. So, you know, it is it is the greatest thing that you can do is to be truth truthful to yourself. So I think that is awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. yeah. I've been really pleasantly surprised by the fact that despite you know it is a rebellion against society and it is a, a surprise for people everybody in my life has been supportive everybody has been positive I haven't had any judgment my dad in particular my dad said wasn't surprised um <laughs> and I said well you know why didn't you tell me yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but no everybody's been brilliant it's been great oh well, I think that's wonderful and yeah I mean oh, coming out stories are all like I don't know anybody that's got the same coming out story as anybody else like I, I do I do love knowing like how these things have happened and like yeah it's wonderful to hear that you've like you've had loads of support as well I, I, I had a very rocky <laughs> journey that I'm not going to go into in this podcast but <laughs> yeah oh well thank you so much Thank you. Where can everyone uh, find out more about you and your books and your books for authors and anything else you would like to add? Yeah, my books are all at my website, rachelmcclain.com, uh, including my Five Steps to Author Success book, uh, which there will be information on there. And also at that site, people can get a free novella, which is the prequel novella to my D.I. Zoe Finch series. So if they want to get a taste of my writing, they can get that there. Fantastic. And Five Steps to Author Success will be out uh, when this show airs. And so I will make sure that all of those links are in the show notes. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And um, of course, thank you to all of the show's listeners and the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black, you are listening to Rachel McLean, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. For the first episode of 2022, I am joined by marketing rock star Ricardo Fayette, and Ricardo is also one of the co-founders of Readsy. We have an in-depth discussion about advertising, about marketing, and what you can do in 2022 to sell more books. So join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.